Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Who Let the Data Out? Essential Data Security. My name is Eliana Raggio, and I'll be your moderator today. And today's webinar is being presented by Dealeron. And for anyone who isn't familiar with Dealeron, well, we're an award-winning website development company and digital agency. And we're best known for our search engine optimization, our best-in-class customer service, and our award-winning websites. Dealeron received the Best in Show Award for Website Design from Dealer Marketing Magazine this year, and was also named the top-rated website provider by Driving Sales in 2012 and 2013. And oh yes, it's official, Dealeron customers have been winners of the Digital Dealer Website Excellence Awards highly coveted overall winner five times in a row. We just won another one, and we're the only website company that can claim that. Dealeron is so committed to lead conversion, optimization, and customer service that we're the only company in the industry to offer a money-back lead guarantee program. So does your website company guarantee you leads? Well, then maybe you should check us out at dealeron.com. And we have a great show in store for you today. We're very pleased to have Russell Grant as our presenter today. Russell Grant is Vice President of Sales for J&L Marketing, the nation's highest rated automotive owner marketing agency, and it's recognized throughout the industry for its data security and data analytics. A 20-year veteran of the automotive industry, his areas of special expertise include data security, strategic planning, new business development, automotive direct marketing, and online reputation. Russell has spoken at 20 groups, driving sales executive summits, and the digital dealer conferences, and he can be reached at rgrant at jandlmarketing.com. Now, during the presentation, if you have any questions, Please use the question feature located on the corner of your screen to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer those questions of general interest. If we're unable to get to your question live, don't worry, we'll respond by email later today. Also, don't forget, a link to download a copy of the webinar recording is also going to be emailed to you later today for your reference, and feel free to share it with friends and colleagues. Oh, guess what? Our good friends at j &L Marketing, they're giving away a fantastic prize today on the webinar. One of you lucky webinar attendees is going to be winning a free iPad Mini. It's valued at $350, but you have to be on the live broadcast to win it. All you have to do is stay tuned for the details after Russell's presentation, and you could be scoring this awesome prize today. And at the conclusion of the webinar, you're going to receive a short survey. Please fill it out because we're always looking for great feedback from our audience. And today we're going to randomly select a couple of people from all the completed surveys to also win some Google Prizes. So let's get started. Let's learn who let the data out. I won't do the rest. Essential data security. Russell Grant, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. You know what? It's been a long time coming that we should have a webinar on this particular subject. And, you know, we were just talking about it before we went live, but there are a lot of dealerships out there who are pretty relaxed with securing the data that they have and all the data that's held within their DMS. And I, this is just so important because you know that if really, really big companies like Visa and Amazon and some other big companies that have had some really serious data breaches, if they can be hacked into, well, who's to stop somebody from stealing the, the information at a dealership, you know, where the security is much more relaxed? So thank you so much for being here today and talking to us about this very important subject. What are we going to be learning about? Well, uh, thanks for having me again, Eliana, and you're exactly right. Is we think about data now, and it's been a buzzword for probably the last year or two on big data and how to use big data. And with all the things in the marketplace, we're able to drive our data to give us better intelligence with how we market or how we run our dealerships. Um, there's also a bigger security risk now with that data and, and getting in the wrong hands. And what we'll be covering today is to be able to identify the most common risk that you guys have as dealers for your data security. And I think equally as important is what is the role of vendors like JNL Marketing for dealerships data security. And at the end of this session, if, when we listen through it, is I want to help you guys develop an action plan for your dealership. And then, of course, at the end, we'll give you plenty of time for questions and answers for any specific needs that you have with your dealership. And the biggest thing 
that I want everybody to concentrate on, or I feel my responsibility is, is the takeaways. Because if I can deliver good takeaways for you guys, that's that's my obligation, and that's why I'm here today is to to drive those takeaways from you guys. And you know, before we talk about a little bit what you were talking about uh, before with Amazon and different uh, security breaches, is I looked up a lot of different security breaches that happen outside of the industry, and a lot of it stems to the financial industry first because that data is even more uh, vulnerable. And I looked up a couple of these different data breaches. I'll go over a couple with the, a couple of them with you in specific. Bank of New York Mellon, for example, they had 12 and a half million customers affected. And basically, what happened is, is they were transporting a vendor was transporting um, tapes, computer tapes that contained 12 and a half million customers' names. The tapes never made it from location A to B, and not only were the tapes lost with name, address, social security number, bank routing information, securities held, but the data was unencrypted. And so what unencrypted basically means oh my is... gosh, that sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, so the people could read the tape, where when you encrypt the tape, even if it got stolen, you couldn't make out the name, address, and, and social security number. And with Bank of New York Mellon, Eliana, which is even more amazing, this happened to them twice, the same exact thing. And so um, the financial sector, we probably have a little more history to look at than, than in the automotive industry itself. And a, a second example is TD Ameritrade. And their database was hacked. And 6.3 million customers were affected. And I think what's important to point out with them is not only did they lose similar type of information, but they had a class action lawsuit so we have legal ramifications with this data as dealers and vendors as well, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But they were, were not only lost a class action lawsuit, but then the attorney general came in and they had to pay a massive fine on top of that. And so that's what we're going to look at today. And imagine if you're in a conversation, if you're TD Ameritrade with the attorney general. And I have no idea what that conversation was said or not said, but I would have to think when the Attorney General's talking to TD Ameritrade, they're not asking them what their intentions were with the data. They're going to drill down and find out specifically what was their process to ensure the security of the data and the steps that TD Ameritrade to secure this information. And I think that's what I'm going to center on with everybody is when j &L Marketing, I'll talk to you about how we entered this process here in a little bit, but there's a big difference between great intention and great process. And we've got to have great process to secure the data. Eliana, a quick poll question before we lead into the presentation. Two poll questions, actually. Yes, audience, we're going to start off with two poll questions. So if you wouldn't mind, please look at your screen now. Here is our first poll question for you. We want to know, how would you rate your current dealership data security. Try and be as honest as possible. All right, please select one of the following answers. Would you consider your current dealership data security to be excellent? Is it above average? Do you think you're right middle of the road? You think you're average? Do you think you're, it's kind of poor? <laughs> Definite room for improvement? Or you have no clue about data security and that's why you're here today. And you know what? That's actually a really good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Once we get a majority of the votes in, we will close the poll and share the results and see what's going on out there in automotive world. And thank you so much, audience, for getting involved with these poll questions. Right after this one, we have a follow-up question for you as well. So actually, we're going to close this poll right now and share the results if you wouldn't mind. Here we go. All right, audience, here we go. 19% of you today said that you would rate your current dealership data security as excellent. That's a lot, 19% of you. 14% of you think that you're above average. Now the majority of you, almost half, 48%, say that you are middle of the road, average, could use some improvement. 10% say that you uh, consider your data security to be poor. And another 10% said that you have no clue about data security, and that's why you're here today. Thank you so much for your votes, everyone. We're going to close this poll and get started on our second question. And this one, this one's a little tougher for you. We want to know, 
Where do you think your dealership's current data security is most vulnerable? Please select one of the following answers. Do you believe that you're most vulnerable when employees leave and take customer databases with them? We've heard a lot of dealerships have that issue when employees leave the dealership and they take the database with them. Do you think it's your vendors who sell or share your data? Or do you think maybe it's the vendors who don't protect your data enough? Are you worried about outside hackers? Or you just, you know what, you have no idea where your dealership is most vulnerable, but <laughs> we're scaring the crap out of you. So whatever the answer is, please let us know. <laughs> Once we have a majority of the votes, we will close the poll and share the results. And Russell, I have to say, I've never actually had to think about this before about you know where a dealership's current data security is most vulnerable so I'm, I'm really interested to see what the audience is going to say today now we have uh, almost everyone voted so thank you so much audience we're going to close this poll and share the results 32 percent of today's audience said they're most worried about employees who leave the dealership and that they will take the customer database with them an additional 32 percent said that they're worried about their vendors who aren't protecting their data when they go into their DMS. 18% of today's audience said it's the vendors who sell or share their data that they're worried about. Only 9% of today's audience say that they're worried about an outside hacker. And another 9% said that they have no idea, but we are scaring the crap out of them. Russell, what do you have to say about these results? Is it right in line with what you're hearing with other people in the automotive sector? Yes, it is. And I think, you know, the first, what the how dealerships view their data security is it was very uh, much in line where 48% thought it was average and then another 20% thought it was below average. Right. And only, 30, only one third of you thought that it was you know, above average or excellent. And, and so what I believe happens with even the 19% that said they're, it's excellent, um, maybe everybody on this call thinks this is an important issue but what about all the other employees at the dealership and so maybe the people on the call have a good sense of why this is so important and hopefully what we'll be able to accomplish today is to give you some things to take back to the rest of your dealership I'm gonna certainly share some stories with working for de working with dealerships on data security of what they're doing and not doing and tell you a couple horror stories from what I've seen with employees what they're doing and a lot of it's, un, I don't think we're doing it intentional, but the, the level of education throughout the dealership is probably low in, with respect to this topic. I mean, you know, tell, me, tell me if I'm wrong, Russell. Do dealerships yeah. kind of wait until they've had a security breach before they say, oh, shoot, we should have done something about that. Let's do it now. Is that usually yeah. when it happens? Well, you know, we haven't heard of major security breaches that I'm aware of, I mean, like the financial sector. So, yeah, we want to we wanna avoid this now. We don't want to put the, uh, the railroad crossing after there was an accident. Uh, we know it's a problem now, so we just got to motivate ourselves to, to educate and have the best processes to get it done. So I'm hopeful that, that we don't, that, that that's not the case. So that second poll question, a solid third of the audience today said that they were most worried about employees who leave and take the customer database. And then another third were as, as interested in their vendors who they believe aren't protecting their data enough. Are those two very valid concerns that dealerships are dealing with right now? Yes. As a matter of fact, I was a, a digital dealer last week and, and a dealer came up to me and said, that was his exact concern. He had an employee leave, took their complete customer list, and took it to the competing dealership that they went and worked for. What? And, and that seems to be very common um, with dealerships. I think that's the number one concern, and that's reflective of the poll here. And then the other thing, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that directly. Inside your dealership, what can we do to prevent this? And then the second thing is, again, vendors and uh, we'll, we're going to have another poll question here in a little bit, but think about how many vendors are in your DMS right now and what's the risk of that and we'll talk about ways from a dealership what you guys can do to minimize this risk. All right, let's go. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. 
So I'm going to give you a little bit of example of J&L and how we got into this process. At J&L Marketing, um, we do a lot of direct mail promotions, number one, and we'll do customer pay service clinics for dealerships. And, and with that, we have a lot of great OEM relationships with BMW, Mercedes, uh, Chrysler, Mini, for example. But anyway, the OEMs brought this issue to us several years ago. And imagine if, if you're, say, a Mercedes or a BMW dealer, and let's just say you're in Southern California or in Beverly Hills. Well, that's how it came to us because if, if you are a dealership in Beverly Hills, think about who your customers are to Highline dealership, actors, actresses, CEOs of major companies. So they're more concerned about the security of that data because more people may want to hack into that data. And that's how this issue came to us. And when we started thinking about it, we said, well, ooh, you know, this is a big deal, and this is a couple years ago. And we, we wanted to look inside the automotive industry to say, how can we make sure our data security is up to speed? And we wanted to know if there was a way to do that in the auto industry for a third party to independently verify our certification of, of data security. We were amazed to find out there's no independent company to do this in the automotive sector. So we kept doing more research because we knew we had to do something. And kind of like the examples I gave, it went back to the financial industry. And what we looked at was this, this SSAE-16. And with SSAE-16 is what it is. It comes from the American Institute of CPAs, from the financial institutions. And it's a compliance that establishes and controls for, to protect pr privacy of customer information. And this process took us about six months. And what we learned was, again, is our intentions to protect dealerships data was 10 out of 10. But our actual process to do it was much lower than that. And this SSAE process tore apart our risk assessment, our monitoring, our information systems, our environmental controls, um, things we never considered, frankly. And one of them, to give you a quick example, is, is a disaster recovery plan. Is what happens when, when your power goes out and you get shut down? Can you get back up online immediately? Because not only do you have to protect this data, if we're working with clients, we've got to be up and running very quickly. And to give you a quick example of that, I live in Orlando, and in 2004, we had three hurricanes that came, in, came through Orlando in one month, uh, Charlie, Francis, and Jean. And the bottom line was 35% of the state lost power for at least one week. And think about Sandy on the, the, the northeast last year or Hurricane Rita or Katrina in Louisiana. So one of the things we had to do with our data was just our risk assessment. We have separate rooms for our data uh, where it's stored with our servers, separate locks and keys. And, you know, the process that we went through was very extensive. And what I'm going to do is share with you guys some of these steps that I think can immediately help you with your dealership. Because when we started this process, before we looked at any of our vendor relationships, we said at J&L, the process starts with us first. And I believe for dealerships, the process starts with you guys internally at the dealerships. So here are a couple of things. Think about the example I gave you where somebody left the dealership and took the data with them. So the first thing we learned in this SSAE certification process was, well, with any employee, what about background checks? You know, what if we could eliminate hiring that person? And I normally ask people if they do background checks, and most people are doing background checks, and at JNL we were as well. What we wanted to do, though, anybody who touched the data, we knew we were at, at, at a higher risk. So we wanted drug, criminal, credit, and references. Now let me say this with background checks. Make sure you check with your state and local laws on this because what you're allowed to do is different from city to city and state to state. But what I'm recommending is, is whatever you're allowed to do, anybody who touches that data, you should be taking that to a further level than a normal employee. So the first step I would tell you is background checks. Um, at the end of the presentation, too, by the way, I'm going to give you a bunch of forms that you can download that will help you with uh, summarizing this presentation. But the second thing 
I don't think background checks is going to avoid the situation for a dealership. You also got to have a confidentiality agreement. Anybody who touches your data, you got to put in writing with that employee that they understand that before you are hired, it's ABC Toyota's data. While you're hired at my dealership at ABC Toyota, it's still the data of the dealership. And if you ever leave for any reason, the data belongs to ABC Toyota. And it was funny when the, the situation where the guy told me that the, the employee took the data, I asked him, well, did you have a confidentiality agreement? He said, no. I said, well, do you think that would have reduced the chances of this happening to you? And he said, yes. Because now what you're doing with your employees, you're making them put in writing that they understand that it's your data and there are consequences if you take that data. And it's easier, as we all know with anything we do, it's easier to correct on the front end than it is the back end. And by the way, if these employees leave, you should probably, if they're, and we'll talk about this in a minute, give them a copy back of their confidentiality agreement so everybody's on the same page with whose data it is. The second thing I think is important, though, just not the confidentiality, I think we need training and instruction within the dealership, letting them know how important this is. And this can, what's great about this, I'm going to talk about DMS and protecting your customer data, but this also obviously affects your processes for your CRM, your social media, or email. This process will have an overlaying effect to other things you do at the dealership. Um, I have a friend of mine, and this was interesting, and I don't know if you guys could relate to this at all, but a friend of mine, she was a social media director at an auto group in the Northeast. And they, they own, they have five rooftops within this, this dealer group. And anyway, she doesn't work for this dealer group anymore. In fact, she hasn't been with them for a year. A month ago, she told me she still has all the usernames and passwords to their Facebook account, to their Google Plus page, to all the review sites and directories for, that she set up for, to gather online reviews. In fact, she still gets emails from the dealership. Any all-employee emails still go to her. She even emailed the dealership back saying, I have all this access, and they still didn't change it. Huh. So these are the, the real-life examples that I hear within the dealership that are happening. And I'll take it a step further to ask you guys a question. Think about with inside your dealership that have you ever um, loaned your username and password, you or anybody at the dealership you know, has ever loaned their username and password for their DMS to a coworker. Think about that. Have you ever loaned a username and password to anybody at the dealership? When I talk to dealers, the overwhelming majority is they hear it happens all the time because Eliana's password isn't working, and so Russell decides to let her borrow it. Okay? I got a better one for you. Has anybody at the dealership ever loaned username and password to a vendor for the DMS? They wouldn't do Nothing. that. Have you ever Would loaned they? it to a vendor? I can tell you from our experience, we're in 25, about 2,500 dealerships DMS throughout any course of a year. And we just had a situation where a dealer, uh, we hadn't done business with them in 18 months. We signed them up to do a customer pay clinic again. We needed to get access to the DMS to find the right customers. And the, the service director said, yeah, you can just use your same username and password from 18 months ago. Think about that. That's 18 months ago, we still have this access. And as a vendor, we don't want to have that access because of the risk involved. So think about your access and security as it relates to uh, any of these topics. And not only that, but we want to establish, I believe, at the dealership, a great password policy. And I think is is we log on to different sites. I believe this is fairly consistent to what you're seeing in the marketplace. Um, Eliana, you were bringing up Amazon and some other sites. I know Twitter just got hacked into, and now within the last couple months, and their username and passwords a lot more secure, meaning eight characters, capital letter, lowercase letter, and at least one number. Right. 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 And then I think too, um, unique to each individual. Eliana, it'll blow you away that at dealerships, think about this for your dealership, a lot of people just have password one that everybody shares the same password. No, they don't. Come on, in this day and age? We, we, like I said, we're in 2,500 different dealers, and it, 
and people are sharing passwords or sharing them with each other or they'll just have the same password. So everybody's got to have their unique password. And so with your password policy, the best way to initiate this is to just have a schedule change where you lock everybody out and you make them resubmit. So that's going to accomplish two things. One, it's going to initiate your new strength and password policy but with at least eight characters. The second thing Eliana is going to do is it's going to get rid of all the vendors that could be in there or old employees that you forgot to disable their username and password. You're going to clean sweep it and start fresh. So in the case of us with the, the dealership I was telling you about, if we had access for 18 months, if they would have instituted this, it would have automatically wiped us out. Just gives you a second chance to make sure only people have access. Right? Right. And the other thing I think you're seeing common when think about when you log in on sites, that when people log in and they, they change their username and password, you don't let it be a previous username and password. It can't be the same as their previous four. And it, it will if somebody tries to log in, if they can't get it right on the fourth attempt, you know, they have to email in to, to get access. You don't let them keep trying a different combination. So I think those are some basic steps and that you would think at each dealership that we'd all be doing. Um, but that would have probably also been a big poll question to see how many of the dealerships actually have this as their something similar to this as their process. I would bet from the dealers I talked to, the majority would be no. Uh, and then here's something that we were at fault of. We have our human resource person walk around our first floor and our second floor of our office building with all our employees. What we found was, and she does this once a month, we had an employee who put a sticky note with their username and password right on their computer screen. <laughs> so we're not, before you, we're not doing that now. This was before our SSAE 16. But again, it, it just goes to show we got people on this call who may think that we're doing a great job with security, but guess what? That's not rep necessarily represented for the other 50, 60, 100 employees at the dealership. So that's why we need a good policy and ways to check to make sure these type of things aren't happening at the dealership. And then this is a little more um, I'm not going to spend as much time on this, but when we went through this process, you know, your firewalls, your VPN network, you got to have a private network when you transfer data. So the best example of this is, and Eliana, this happens all the time. So we do direct mail promotions, and so we could have a big event at a dealership on a Saturday. Well, the dealership will start emailing their customer list back and forth to the salespeople, so they can call the customer in advance of the promotion. And that's normal. That's great, because you want to call your customers and stay in contact with them. What's not great is you, can't, you, you don't want to email a customer list, because that's an unprotected network. Anybody can get into that. So um, the best way for me to explain it is, like if you watch shows like CSI or 24, I used to be a big 24. I love fan. 24, yeah. Yeah, and Jack Bauer always used, are we on a secure line? Are we on a secure line? <laughs> and, right? And that's what you want with your data. When you're transferring email, there's a process to set up a private network when you email things back and forth that that can't not be accessed from the outside. And so that's something for you guys to think about. And simple things like antivirus and anti-spam, these are the things we're talking about that was probably third on your list where it's eliminating people hacking into your site. And then you got to note how to encrypt your data when it's moving. For the example, the bank I gave you that just their, 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 their highly confidential information, they just had it on the computer tape. And then backups, and we, I gave you the example of the hurricane situation of what happens in a disaster, can you get back up and running? This is probably a little more advanced. The password policy is something easier to institute. But I think it's something as a dealership we should understand. And then I would tell you this, from the dealership level, I would say this is the most common mistake that's being made. Remember the friend that I gave to you. And we're going to give you charts and ways for you to organize this at the end, so I think this will be simple for you. But what about termination of an employee? 
and termination may be the wrong word, but any time an employee leaves, they may not have got fired, they may have quit, they, anything could have happened, but any time an employee leaves. When I talk to dealers, I think it is standard if, you know, if Eliana is not working for the dealership, we're going to ask for her key if she has it to the building. But what about the other things? What about any security code she has to any other offices? What about username and password getting disabled from your DMS or your intranet systems, CRM tools? What about your email access, your phone extension, or your voicemail? You've got to have a process when an employee leaves so that that employee who leaves doesn't have access to your vital information. And then here's the last one that we certainly implemented after this SSA, SSAE 16 process was an evaluation system. And um, a lot of people refer to it as an exit interview. And we want to have an exit interview with any employee that, that leaves j &L Marketing for whatever reason if they're touching either our data or our customers' data. And the reason for that when we went through the process is think about, you know, if somebody leaves your dealership and they hate the owner, they hate the car business, they hate their boss, they hate their coworkers, they hate themselves, whatever the reason is, we don't want somebody leaving our dealership who has all this venom and an ax to grind. And, and the easiest way to minimize that is to give them peace of mind and let them say their piece. And for us, that was a step that is now mandatory. And more importantly, I think you'll also find out when you have these exit interviews, if you guys have them already, you may learn some ways to improve your business and the operations of your business. Certainly, you're not going to listen to 100% of what everybody says, but there's going to be key things that are going on in your dealership that you may be tipped off to. But that wasn't the direct purpose. The direct purpose was to take the customer I was, the, the number one reason you guys gave an employee leaving the dealership is this evaluation system. If, if, they, if they have an ax to grind, let them do it at the dealership instead of taking it, taking it out on us later. And then it may be a good idea if they sign that, that agreement to uh, the confidentiality agreement, you hand that back to them so they understand that this is, or maybe not hand it to them, show it to them again. So that's, you know, from the dealership part of it, by the way, when we, when we look at our internal systems, you're going to answer the number two question, too, about your vendors. How do we hold our vendors accountable? Meaning, if you don't understand this internally from your perspective, you're not going to know the right questions to ask your vendor, and you're not going to know how to hold them accountable. And it's going to be the wild, wild west with your data flying all over the place, and it's not going to be secure. All right. Well, I'm just going to go there now. Do you have a list of questions we should be asking our vendors? <laughs> yes, we do. And we do. We're okay, doing. we're going to get to that because I don't want to. I don't yes, want to. I don't want to. You know, blow your roll here. So. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, well, that's what we're going to talk about. Does you have what it takes to ask your vendor? I'm going to give you some questions, but first, I would like to uh, go to our next poll question and get some of your all's feedback to questions that that, that we have for our poll question. Okay, audience, you got it. Here we go. Next poll question is on your screen right now. Please, if you wouldn't mind, answer this question for us. How many vendors currently have access to your dealership DMS? Please select one of the following answers. Is it 1 to 4, 5 to 7, 9 to 12? My gosh, that sounds like a lot. Is it more than 12? Or maybe it's just so many you have no idea. <laughs> so whatever the answer is, we want to know how many vendors currently have access to your dealership DMS. And once we get a majority of the votes, we'll close the poll and share the results. And Russell, before we get to the answers provided by our amazing audience today, could you tell us, don't give us the answer, but is there a national average that you found out? of how many people do have access to a dealership's DMS? Yeah, we're going to talk about that too. And from me talking to, I don't have a national average, but from talking to dealers and doing similar things like this, it's usually about 10 to 12. No, no, don't get... Oh. <laughs> All right, well, there you have it, audience. Left. The average is 10 to 12. <laughs> <laughs> so much for the poll. 
Yeah. Well, Let's nobody see. listens to me anyway. They're going to fill in what they think. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> well, there's a caveat to that answer, too, so we'll discuss it. But I'm interested to see what you guys say because in, in your all situation, it may be less than that or more than that. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I don't because I didn't want to influence what the audience was going to say. But let's close this poll and share the results and see what the audience had to say. 32%, so today's majority, 32%, said that they only have one to four vendors with access to their dealership DMS. Now, you know, surprisingly, when we put this question together, Russell, I, I thought for sure there'd be very, very few people who would say only one to four, because I think that's really, really low. And kudos to those dealerships who only have one to four, I would think. Um, let's see, 11% of today's audience said five to eight. 16% said 9 to 12, 26% said that they have more than 12 people going into their DMS, and 16% said they really have no idea. And before I turn it over to you for your comments, Russ, I want to get to this comment from Marie. She says, last year, we cut off everyone's access to our DMS and waited to see who would scream. <laughs> and then we made them provide us with their security agreements before we would reinstate their access. Marie, I wish I could give you a virtual high five right now for that. That sounds like such a smart move. So thank you so much for that comment, Marie. So Russell, um, we talked about this earlier. You said the average of the people that you've been talking to is about 10 to 12 vendors that currently have access to a dealership's DMS, correct? Yes. Can I, can I make one comment on Marie's? Of course, absolutely. Yeah, that was a great comment, and that's something to think about with the vendors that are in your DMS now is, is number one, you probably want to go back and read what your agreement is. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, but know what your agreements say because there's a term out there that'll, that, that's common in the industry called inventory farming, where your inventory could be getting shared with places you have no idea. Um, and if you want to see that, what you could do is just Google. Google, take any car on your lot, Google it with the VIN number and see which sites it shows up on. Hmm. And, and you may find it in places that you, you never gave permission. So the first thing from, from what Marie said is beautiful because you want to reset where you are with this and, and, and um, go back and read your agreements, what you agreed to and what you didn't. And then because more of what I'm going to talk about is moving forward what to do, but what Marie said is probably what we should all do today is assess where we are with the vendors in it. Should they be in it? Where are they given access to? And I have a vendor chart that I'm going to share with everybody that or you all can download and what will help you start what Marie's talking about doing right now. Yeah, and before we get to some more of your automotive awesomeness, let's get to this last poll question, audience. Yeah. It's on your screen, and we want to know, how well do you think your vendors protect your data? Now, that's a very, very interesting question you have here, Russell. So please select one of the following answers, audience. Do you believe that your vendors protect your data Excellent. Would you rate them above average? You think they're average? You think they're poor? Or you think, I don't know, but that is a scary thought. <laughs> so once we get a majority of the votes in, we will close this poll and share the results. And you know, I'm, I'm watching the votes as they come in, and I guess, Russell, I guess it would be, you know, if it was my dealership, if I owned a dealership, would I want anything less than excellent or above average, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's the, the question I would ask. But you know what? We do well, have I a... Think, Go ahead, Russell. Yeah, I think, no, I'm sorry. I think what happens is that there's a lot of powerful things you can do with the data. And generally what my experience in the, the dealership culture is when a general manager or a dealer wants something to give them result A, and this company is going to bring you result A, they're not asking the question about can they secure the data as much. So in the dealer culture, and a lot of times, the dealer's very aggressive and takes their chances later and figures out the rest later. Give me what I want now, and I'll figure out the consequences later. And while I think that's still a good philosophy to give me what I want now, we got to consider those consequences and kind of burn the candle at both ends. Yes, we want what we want now, but we got to also make sure we protect that data and that's got to be an equally top priority. 
Well, I will tell you this. Let's close this poll and share the results because almost everyone has voted. And just these last couple of poll questions spurred on some really amazing uh, comments like the one from Marie and some great questions from the audience, which we will get to in a little bit. So audience, if you have a question for Russell, please send them on in and we are going to be get to getting to your amazing... <laughs> These questions are really good, Russell. You've got some good people on here on today's broadcast. Okay, so I want you to know there is not one person on today's show that believes that their vendors are doing an excellent job at protecting their data. That is a scary thought. Zero. Zero. Okay. 13%, however, do believe that their vendors are doing an above average job. The majority, 61%, said that their vendors do an average job at protecting their data. 4% said that they were poor. And 22%, that's a big percentage, by the way, says that they don't know, but yes, they agree that that is a pretty scary thought, that they don't know how, the, how well their vendors are doing at protecting their data, and those vendors are in their DMS. Thank you so much, audience, for being so honest with your answers. We really do appreciate it. Russell, what do you have to say about that? Well, I think, um, I think a lot of things, certainly. With respect to the vendors, that was our mission is I believe it's the vendor's job to prove to the dealer community that we can protect the data, and, and that's on us. I believe, in my opinion, I believe it's on you as the dealer to ask the right questions as well because you probably can't assume that every vendor is going to be progressive and, and, and set up the proper processes to do the right thing. And, um, you know, we, we were led into this two years ago where we saw how important it was. And I think as a community with dealers and vendors alike, we can avoid Eliana, what you were talking about at the beginning, the major security breach, we, we don't want to have that happen. And in fact, as JNO Marketing, we go in front of this, we will share our process with our competitors because we wouldn't even want our worst competitor or our best competitor to have this problem. Because it's bad for the entire industry. And, and that's certainly not good for us or any of the dealer community. So it's very interesting. It makes me more motivated that what we're doing is valuable here today. It makes us more motivated that we got to keep getting this message out there to the dealer community. And hopefully you guys are just as motivated to, one, with inside your dealership, do something about it. And then, two, to, to motivate your vendors that they better start playing ball the way you want. Is that good, Eliana? That's awesome. Go ahead. <laughs> You're on a roll. I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> what else right. do you have for us? <laughs> so I think with, with vendor requirements, what you want to think about before, if we agree that we can't let vendors who can't protect our data, if we agree that that's a bad idea, then the next question is, is what do you need to be thinking about? Well, the first thing, you want to be able to ensure that they, can, they have the security and confidentiality of your customer data. You want to make sure they have systems that protect against the threats to security. And then you want to protect against the unauthorized access. The other thing that I think that's not on there is, is you want to understand what, you, what you're agreeing to with your vendor. Because from a lot of dealers who tell me, they didn't realize that they were letting their inventory be shared, for example. So I would go back to Marie's point and make sure you do a reset of your system where you are now. Moving forward with your vendors, you need to understand your agreement, but here are the types of things you want to consider. And when you guys choose a vendor, okay, when you choose a vendor, think about this. How many of you saw, have your vendor sign a non-disclosure? That they're not going to share your data or sell it without written consent from you guys, and it's only going to be used for the purpose is you, the dealer. A non-disclosure. Now, this would have been another uh, good poll question, Eliana, is how many of them have signed non-disclosure? Because we, again, 2,500 dealers a year that we're in their DMS, less than 20% ask us to sign it. Really? That num yeah, that number's going up, but not really. And, and I think that re number's so low for reasons we talked about earlier, in our case, we come in OEM recommended in a lot of situations, so there's a lot of trust built into the process. But that's not good enough for you, the dealer. 
you got to have it in writing what our agreement is with not our data, your data, your customer's data. Now, I'll, I'll take it a step further with your customer's data. I would, you know, I talked to the deal. It's your number one asset. Think about of all that, it's more valuable than your building, anything you have. And that may not be true all the time, but think about when a dealership sells with the blue sky. There is no blue sky on a new point because there's no customer data. Blue sky comes up from your data. So the power of that data is worth a lot of money, and we got to protect it. And with any of your vendors, they better recognize that and put it in writing. So the second thing you need to consider with choosing a vendor, in my opinion, is what's the business purpose for them accessing your data? And, and I'll say it this way kind of directly. Just a, a vendor, if their only purpose is, is ROI, that probably isn't good enough. So there's got to be a legitimate business purpose for them to want your data. And I'll say this about that. There are a lot of programs and vendors on the market that need access to your data and can do some incredible things with it. So in most cases, the, the vendor is going to have a good business purpose, but you want that documented. And you need to know what part of the DMS you're giving them access to. So if somebody just needs to pull your inventory, you shouldn't give them access to your entire database, by the way. So, so what you is can the set you can set different security parameters, right? Correct. So like one yeah. vendor could have full access, and then the other right. vendor only has access to, you what know, bits need. and pieces of it. Right. And well, and that's why I was telling you passwords get shared sometimes. Right. Because within the dealership, let's say somebody's looking something up in the dealership, every employee doesn't have the same access and most of the ones I talk to. And so, oh, I can't get into that, I need it. And then, oh, Eliana, can I just use yours? You can see everything. And and that sometimes happens there. But yeah, for the vendors, you, you need to establish that. And that goes back again to Marie's comment of resetting um, where you are with your dealerships. I mean, where, where are you with your dealership, with your vendors in your DMS? Do they need access? Where do they need it to? Why? What's your agreement on the data? So those are some of the things with your choosing a vendor. I'll Ooh. give you a site that you can, we have a non-disclosure we have. It's just a sample, but I'll show you the one that will help you in, in coming up with a non-disclosure with some of the language. But I would say to that, we're just giving you a sample. This is a legal thing, so I recommend highly that you have your legal team look at that. This looks very official, and I saw that that was more than one page. You only showed us the first page, though, right? Yeah, and then we'll we'll have the form where you guys can download all that stuff too. That's cool. All right. Yeah, and then the business purpose. You know, I recommend you guys looking at this act. It's the Graham Leach Bliley Act, and it talks about you know data and sharing and uh, gives a lot of different perspectives of this. And if you want to educate yourself a little more on it. Google the Graham Leach Bliley Act, and it'll it'll talk about the role of data and uh, the laws behind it. So that's a great act as far as to that for you guys to get a little more education. And I think you know, as the questions as I go through this and talk to dealers about this, is when we go back to the poll question of how good the vendors are. Then the next question is is well. What should we hold our vendors accountable to, I think? You know, as a dealership, what should I make my vendor do or not do? And so I put up here, should your vendor be SSA 16 compliant? And for us, I'm going to answer the question this way. For us, the answer was yes. We had to have an independent source tell you, the dealer, that j &L Marketing can protect your data. And for us, it was on us to prove to you that we could do it, not the dealer to work with the vendor to get us up to speed. So I'll leave that question to you for you guys when you talk to your vendors about what you want them to hold them accountable to. But I think here are the key things that you want to, if, that, if your answer is no to that, then I think at a minimum you want to start asking your vendors about their access and password policies. What about their firewalls and antivirus, their equipment monitoring, their data encryption, their backups, their continuity disaster recovery plan? 
remember, you're going to be a lot more knowledgeable to talk to your vendors if you're doing it internally first. You've got to understand this from an internal standpoint. If not, you're not going to know how to hold your vendors accountable. And Eliana, the last poll where the, the I think the most disturbing number, not disturbing, but the, the number that I would really like to change is the, the dealers that didn't really know what their vendors were doing and how well equipped they were to handle the data. Yeah. We should at least know, know what our risk is and know the questions to ask. And, and I think, by the way, if I were a deal right now, I'd be thinking, oh, my vendor's not going to answer all these questions, you know? And I would suggest to you, I think they are, because as a vendor, we don't want this problem either. And they're going to be, I think, more open than maybe you would guess, in my opinion. And if they're not open to discussing this at all, then that may lead you to another question, you know, if, if that's the type of vendor I want to deal with. Because whether it's marketing companies like j &L Marketing, website providers like Dealer On, uh, we all got competition. You know, there's no shortage of choices in the industry. So uh, there, there's not any there's not any system that's in your DMS that you don't have a choice. I don't believe as a dealer. There's competitors for everything out there. So I think those are some of the things to consider. And I would tell you this. I'm gonna get into the takeaways, but I think this is the number one takeaway from a dealer. Um, I was talking to Dealer Track that owns uh, Arcona DMS. And it was interesting on our poll question of how many vendors are in the DMS. I would suggest to you guys the answer that you gave me is probably double to what you think it is. Really? <laughs> yeah. You think they're lowballing it? No, I don't think they're lowballing. I think they told me what they thought was in there. But the answer is double, and here's why. There's two reasons. There's two primary reasons why. One. What about the vendor like j &L Marketing who the, the, the dealership never locked us out and we just continued having access and you've forgotten about that dealer? So you set and forget, right? Okay, j &L needs access, set and forget, and, and six months later go by and you forgot who's in there and who's not. So uh, dealer track was telling me, oh, yeah, we know who the dealer gives permission to and we know how many have access, and that number's a lot more than what they think it is, the dealers per se. Hmm. That's number one. Number two, you have another situation, and this is why you really got to start asking your vendors questions. You have your your vendors also have vendors, so you give access to company ABC into your data. There may be their vendor may have also have access to the data because they need vendors to help them with their programs. So the 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 situation gets a little more complex. Um, and that number is probably closer 20 to 25 that are actually in a dealer's DMS. And it's going to depend on the size of the dealer and how many, and every dealer is going to be different. So I'm just telling you that number may be double the way you think it is. So here's, here's the number one thing I would, if, if I did nothing else, I would create a vendor chart. And this gets into a little bit what Marie was saying as well. I would create a vendor chart with all of the vendors who have access to your data. I, I didn't write this down because I think Marie's point's a good one to just reset the whole thing, by the way. And that'll kick out the people that are in there that you don't know about that are in there. But you develop a vendor chart, and you're going to list all your vendors have access to your, your vendor chart. You should also probably put the length of term in an agreement, meaning do you have a six-month uh, contract with them. Start date, end date. And you should circulate this vendor chart once a month to all your managers so that if uh, your dealership's not doing business with the vendor, you eliminate that account from your DMS. This, this would be true. I would be willing to guess that 90% of the dealers of vendors inside your DMS that you currently don't know about. So that'll eliminate, if that's happening, those situations, and you're able to disable the usernames and passwords. What it also does, if you send this to your management team, it brings up another question of why do they why does this vendor need access to our DMS? Right? Maybe the general manager asked that question. And it brings up good dialogue within your management team to help clean this up. And remember, your your all's number two answer, or actually was tied for number one, this is where you think you're most susceptible with your vendors. So your vendor chart will give you a great way to organize this. And 
that's what I would tell you here for the takeaways from you guys. I'm going to give you a site that you can download a bunch of these forms. Is number one, create the, the vendor checklist. I think that's the number one thing you can do. What about your dealership's checklist? Third thing I would think about, how do we hold our vendors accountable? I got some forms that's going to help you with all this stuff that we're talking about. This is a, a no-brainer in my opinion. 100% of the time, non-disclosure forms for your vendors inside your DMS. For vendors inside the DMS, but also for the employees as well? Yeah, that's, that's more of a confidentiality agreement, similar yeah. type of agreement, right? Yep, for your employees. That's another probably good takeaway as well. And I would tell you this, you know, the most famous rule that I know of that ever existed from when I was a little kid is the 80-20 rule, right? Do this 80% and 20% in that whole relationship. I think this 80-20 rule will work in the opposite effect to our benefit, meaning if you just put in 20% of the effort with the basic stuff, the low fruit things that you can do, you will avoid 80% of the risk. It won't make you perfect by any means, but if you can just do some of the basic, basic stuff, and if all you get out of this, this webinar is to eliminate the most common mistakes that are happening, the easy fixes, the low fruit, you will take away the majority of your risk that you have. More importantly, I think once you get into it, just like anything, right, when you start something and you, you'll start finding other ways to make your uh, dealership's data more secure. So avoid the most common mistake. For you guys, and this was what we wanted to build for you guys, was what to really give you something to take back to your dealership, to get a point person at your dealership to, head, to help take this back to your other employees. On our website at www.jandlmarketing.com, jandlmarketing.com, if you click on our site, to the top left, you'll see a, a little icon, four tools to keep your data secure. It'll have some of the agreements, the checklist, and the things we talked about today. You can click on that, and you can download these forms very quickly, and it'll give you a great step to go back to your dealership. I would also suggest what we talked about earlier, Google and the Graham Leach Bliley Act to give you more information on this. And then really look at this SSA 16 as far as um, what your vendors should be thinking about doing and how you want to talk to them. And Eliana, that is the end of my presentation. Russell, that was really, really cool that you, you uh, listed those four um, tools on your website. Audience, I hope you take advantage of that. Not often do we get a presenter who does that for us. You know, they might give you one, but he's giving you four different things that are going to help you today to secure your dealership data. So thank you so much, Russell. Great presentation. I have to say, even though it's, you know, Halloween's right around the corner, this kind of gave me the chills at how really <laughs> easy it is for just one unscrupulous person to get access to the DMS and do some real damage to a business. So thank you so much for opening all of our eyes up to this. This is definitely a, a problem that more dealerships should pay attention to. Audience, I know you've already sent in some great questions for Russell, but if you have any more questions, please, now's a great time to send them in. And we're going to be getting to those questions in just a minute. But we have a little bit of business to take care of. It's that time. If you missed it at the beginning of the webinar, well, I announced that our good friends at JNL Marketing are giving away a really great prize today on the webinar. One of you lucky webinar attendees will win a free iPad Mini valued at $350. All you have to do is answer a simple question about today's presentation. And the first one to write in the correct response wins this awesome prize today. Can I win, Russell? Is it possible? My no? Crickets. Um, okay. Get to your keyboards. You're already a winner. You're already a winner, Eliana. <laughs> oh, am I? Yeah. So, audience, get to your keyboards, get ready, and good luck, everyone. Here is your question. What is the name of the standard discussed in the presentation that refers to data security commonly used in the financial sector? Oh, we have a winner. You know what? You guys are all winners because you know what? You guys all got it right. Oh, most of you got it right. Okay, our winner today is Bert Hodge. He was the first one in with the correct response. The correct response is 
SSA E16. Congratulations, Bert Hodge. I know you're probably high-fiving people around your office, but if you could, get back to your keyboard real quick and let me know what dealership you're from so that we can give you a proper congratulations. You have just won an iPad Mini valued at $350. And Bert from Heritage Ford, Indiana, congratulations. If you could also send in your mailing address, that iPad Mini is going to come directly from J&L Marketing. And of course, we want to congratulate Bert from Heritage Ford, Indiana, and we want to thank J&L Marketing for their incredible generosity. That was so much fun. And you know, if you have another iPad Mini laying around, you know, Russell, you can always send one my way too. That's right. <laughs> Look at me. Look at me trying to get an iPad Mini. I never get one. All right. Thank you so much for playing, everyone. We're going to get to our first question, which actually came in pretty early. This one came from Scott. And Scott, I think, is asking the question that we all want to know. He says, how long does the SSAE-16 take? How much does it cost? And can anyone do it? So, Russell, you told us all about this cool SSAE-16. Is that something that you believe dealership, dealerships should be doing? Or that we should just, you know, require that of our vendors? Yeah, um, okay, so I think there are a couple different segments of that. It took us about um, six months to complete everything because there's a list of documentation that you have to show that you're actually doing the necessary steps to uh, complete the to complete the SSA. So it took us about six months. We probably reviewed it for six months and deciding what was the best play for us. But I think what what I think with the SSA 16, the reason I shared it with everybody here was at the dealership level, I'm not sure how important it is other than to understand it. And I think it's something for the vendor community that it's a great way for us as a vendor to prove to you the dealer. Um, I don't know from you guys doing it at the dealership level if, if that's something you guys need to do as much. But yes, I do believe anybody can do it. and. Uh, can get information on that. Did you did you say how much it would cost? Well, I think there's a couple different things because you have to get an independent firm. But it was um, I know our owner handled that part of it. But I okay. know I know it cost upwards of ten thousand dollars just for the fees and the, the for the process that needs to happen. And more importantly for us, there were thousands of dollars that we had to do with. Um, for example, all of our servers had to go in a private room, and new servers, and the temperature in that room had to be different. So I don't know how much the, the dollars amounted up to when you gotcha, viewed gotcha. everything and the quality control that we had. But the way we looked at it was um, it made us um, to come to be able to go back to t tell the dealers. What's interesting in our situation is the owner of JNL Marketing, Scott Joseph, also owns three Honda dealerships. And so when he was learning about this, he, he freaked out from two perspectives. One is the owner of JNL Marketing, and he goes, heck, if we're not doing this the, the way it should be done, I know my three dealers aren't. And so he had a freak out from multiple levels, if you can imagine that. Oh, I can totally imagine that. Okay. Um, uh, thank you so much for the great question, Scott. We're going to get to this great question from Joshua. He says, would it be okay to have more vendors in your DMS if you have more than one DMS across an auto group? Um, could you repeat that? I want to make sure I understand it. Would it be okay to have more vendors in your DMS if you have more than one DMS across an auto group? Oh, so I think, I, if I understand the question, let, let's just say you have five different dealerships with inside your DMS if they're an auto group. Right. You may have more vendors than the five or eight because your Toyota store wants to do one marketing program, your Honda store uses a different company. So should you have more vendors? Um, probably, yeah, absolutely. I think the question is, I don't know if the question to me is is how many vendors you have in your DMS. I think the question is is what steps are you taking to ensure that that vendor can secure the data? And what business purpose do they have? Meaning, 
if there's a hundred different ways for you to make money or have good reasons for people to be in your DMS and those hundred vendors check out, then you may have a need to have a lot. I'm using hundred as an exaggeration. Sure. But you may need more people in your DMS. And I'll take it the other way. I don't think the answer is, well, we don't want anybody ever coming in our DMS again. Because if you do that, you're going to be missing out on a lot of powerful things in the marketplace that can be done with your data. Yeah, and I, I feel like also, let's say, for instance, this auto group has three different DMSs. I feel like that's three chances for them to get, you know, to not keep their data secure. So yeah, they have three times the amount of work, I would think. Yeah, and a lot of times what happens is with the dealer group, let's just say they're on ADP, there'll be three different store numbers for the rooftops that they have. And so maybe a, another point to that question would be is to make sure that from dealer to dealer who's allowing access to their DMS, that they're only allowing access into the store that they need. So, for example, if you have um, Russell Grant Honda, Russell Grant Toyota, and Russell Grant Mazda, if, if a vendor comes into there for the Toyota store, I should only see Toyota information, not the other stores. Right. Okay. Well, Joshua, great question. Thank you so much for that. And I have another question from Josh, not the same person. <laughs> All right. Josh wrote in, is it a common practice for dealers to have a waiver for vendors to sign to access information? Now, Russell, I know earlier you said that only about 20% of the dealerships that your company does business with have ever asked for, um, you know, any kind of a non-disclosure agreement or, you know, something like that. Um, but I guess Josh wants to know, have you learned that it's more common for dealers to have that, that paperwork for vendors to sign in order to access their information? We yeah, want all dealerships to be doing common. it, right? <laughs> Yes, all dealers should be doing it, and I think it's more common with the dealer groups because what generally happens is with that is the, the dealer groups have personnel that are in charge of just this specific thing. And so the single rooftop dealerships may not ask for it enough, but um, if the my point would be as a dealership, that's one thing you shouldn't bat an eye about being shy about. It's absolutely acceptable for, for us to be handed to, and it should be mandatory that we give it back to you. Right. Thank you so much for that. Great question, Josh. And question. Um, our last question comes to us from our friend Marie, who wrote in that great comment earlier. Marie, I bet when you were coming into today's webinar, you didn't think we'd be talking about you through the whole webinar. <laughs> <laughs> but she has, um, she has another great uh, statement and question for you. So. Marie says, sometimes, though you, though you are held hostage by your manufacturers as part of your dealership agreement as to what data they have access to and what they can do with it, how do you handle non-disclosure with manufacturer-required vendors? Which, you know, Russell, you should know because you are a manufacturer-required vendor, right? Or you're a manufacturer-approved well, yeah, vendor. Right. I think what Marie's asking is that the OEMs um, want access to your data as well. And um, from a dealership's perspective, I think we're. I think what Marie's asking is what are, when, when they're asking us to push information that's not used for our benefit, it's used for the brand overall. And um, that's an interesting debate that's going on in the dealership uh, level and in the, the online community where I read those type of questions. That's probably above my pay scale to answer, um, but yeah, it's a question you need to be asking of even your OEM with the information you're giving them. And um, she goes on to say that, um, it, it, just as an example, she sells more, her dealership sells more than one brand of car, so she says she knows on ADP most vendors request access to report generators. In that function, you cannot restrict what customers they look at. For instance, if those vendors are hired to do work for Subaru, they sell Subaru, they could also yeah. look at all of their Audi customers too, for instance. You know? So how do you, I mean, there's only so many restrictions you can put on somebody, you know, and still yeah. maintain the data security. 
maybe that net to Marie's question is, is you're given more access than you want to and that can't be controlled. And so that gets back into your non-disclosure. Does that help put a safety net under that? Um, um, so what Marie's saying, I think, is we're giving up information we don't want to because um, we don't have a way to, to, to identify it that way. And that probably gets back to your non-disclosure with your agreements on what they're going to do with that data because you already know you're at more of a risk by giving up too much information that you don't want to be. And um, what's great about the, the points Maria is making is, is you can tell she's put a lot of time in this and thought before this. And well, the stuff we talked about was at the basic level. And when you, you tackle these things, there are going to be more things that come out of it. And you answer one question, it's going to lead to another question. And the goal of what we were trying to do today is get, let's take care of the, the, the easy stuff. Um, for Marie's question, what, what I would directly recommend is the non-disclosures for that. And um, certainly from a legal standpoint, you know, your th this issue needs some um, legal expertise in terms of the dealership levels as well. Uh, yeah, you know what? <laughs> We are getting some, some interesting comments in your answer to this. So, for instance, David said, yeah. if your OEM requires you to allow the vendor in, how do you get a non-disclosure from them? Okay, so if the vendor requires you. No, if the OEM requires you and says, the this, vendor? let this vendor, yes, yeah, this vendor is mine, you let them in, let them do whatever they want, then your hands are tied, right? Well, that's a great question because that's what originally led us into this situation where we were doing work with Mercedes and BMW and they were helping co-op the program that JNL Marketing did and then then the pushback came from the dealer back to the OEM, the OEM back to us and that's what got that in two years ago for us to start this process. Um, so I don't know if I have the, the magic wand answer to that, however, um, I would bang and scream about that because we may not be able to fix everything today, but the more dialogue we have on this issue between OEM, dealer, and vendor, this situation will get better and it will get fixed. And, and more importantly, the number one thing is going to happen, the data is going to be more secure than it was you know, a year, two, three years ago. I agree. I, I don't have, I know, yeah. I totally agree with you. I think that if dealerships start demanding that dialogue from their OEM, then the OEM will start caring more about the dealership data security, and it'll all tie a nice big bow and a ribbon on top of it. And, and Oh, believe uh, me, they'll go back to the, the, to the vendor. They may not tell you that, oh, well, I'm going to go bang on the vendor now, but that, that's the conversations I know we had, and, and that's what freaked us out a couple years ago. And right, we knew right. we had something. We knew we we knew we had to do something about it. Now, were we able to correct that situation as a vendor in one day? No. You know, in, in our case, it took us a year. Um, last comment comes in from Larry. Larry, thank you so much for being here today. He said, "Should a store push the data rather than allowing unfettered access to their DMS?" Great, 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 great question. I know it sounds like it would fix everyone's problems, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, well, um, it's a complicated. It's a great point, and a lot of a lot of dealer groups they may just push the data where you're not extracting the data. You FTP the data. Um, I would still say whether or not you choose to do that, the vendor still has that data now, and the challenge is with pushing the data. Depending on the program you're in, you may need daily access. So, for example, we have a program where we match up service appointments. We need to get into your data every day to do that program, and and setting up it becomes problematic of pushing it every day. Um, however, on the data security, even if you push it, the vendor still has the data. So, um, does it help you only push the data you want to push? I think it handles that part of the question. Um, I think the bigger issue is though, gets back to the vendor. The number one question to me is, is your vendor qualified to secure your data? Regardless if they extract it or you push it to them. Because if they can't secure your data, even if you push it to them, you're still at risk. 
Agreed. Russell, this was definitely an eye-opening presentation. Thank you so much for bringing this to our attention and for bringing this to our audience. You are wonderful. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Eliana, thank you very much. And, and thank you guys, everybody, for logging on. And uh, you all had awesome, awesome questions. And some of the questions I wasn't able to directly answer, but I think it's a start of, of, in the dealer community if we continue to ask the right questions and start holding vendors, OEMs, and dealers accountable, we're going to fix this uh, problem. And it's not going to be in a day, and it's not going to be in a week. But, you know, it would be nice to come back two years from now and talk about how great this was. <laughs> it would be. Okay, audience, if you want to get in touch with Russell, his contact information is on your screen. And don't forget to go to jnlmarketing.com to get those awesome forms that Russell told us about earlier to help you and your dealership secure your data better. Thank you so much, Russell. We're going to button up this show now. Of course, we're past the top of the hour, so any questions that weren't answered during the time allotted, well, we'll answer them by email later today. I want to remind the audience that a link to download a copy of today's webinar recording is going to be emailed to you later today for your reference. Please share it with friends and colleagues. This is a great one. And today's webinar is also going to be posted online within 24 hours. So just go to dealeron.com slash webinars and click on the link on the right-hand side for on-demand webinars to access any of our past webinars. You can also view and register for our upcoming webinars as well. Also, at the conclusion of this webinar, in just a moment, you're going to receive a short survey. Please fill it out and let us know what you thought of Russell's presentation. We're always looking for great feedback from our audience. Today we're going to randomly select a couple of people from all the completed surveys to also win some Google Prizes. And hey, invitations will be going out tomorrow for our next webinar. It's going to be on Halloween, October 31st, and it is The Scary Truth, Seven Best Practices you're probably not using. So here's a question for you. Are your dealership's best practices really the very best? Don't be afraid to admit that they may not be. Mark McGurin of PCG Consulting works with dealers all over the country to improve their internet, BDC, and digital marketing departments, and he has seen it all, including the scary truth that most dealerships are falling frightfully short on updating and executing best practices, which could turn even the simplest process into a dreadful nightmare. During this incredible, spine-chilling, one-hour Halloween presentation, he will dive into seven best practices that you're probably not using. This frightfully good session will teach you how to improve your appointment show rate, eerily simple ways to implement video into your processes with any CRM, what must be sent out to a customer on the first day a lead comes in, best practices to handle the ever-elusive and unresponsive ghost lead, and so much more. So if you want to learn the scary truth, seven best practices you're probably not using, then this is a webinar too, wicked good to miss. It's going to be a scream. This will be another fabulous presentation by your friends at DealerOn. And don't forget, DealerOn's weekly webinars are held on Thursdays, 12 noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. And we have some awesome webinar subjects planned for the rest of this year. But if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, regarding these webinars and our topics, then feel free to contact me directly. Again, my name is Eliana, and I love hearing from you, so you can email me at eliana at dealeron.com or track me down online. I'm on all the automotive social networks as well as Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and I dare you to find me. Thank you all so very much for spending this time with us today, and I hope to see you all on a future webinar in our continuing education series. Thank you so much, and have a good one.